This is Unwind Your Mind Back to God, written by David Hofmeister and read by Tarana Singh. Today we continue with Book 1, Laying the Foundation. Chapter 4, The Serenity Prayer, No Control Over the World. David, let us go to the very core of the matter so we can be clear that this need not be a long journey. I want to go right for the core, so there is clarity. A Course of Miracles is a 1,200-page book. The wisdom at its core is contained in the Serenity Prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. In a nugget, the course is about receiving the wisdom to tell the difference between the first two statements. The things I can change and the things I cannot. To accept the things we cannot change and change the things we can, we need the wisdom to know the difference. That is where discernment and discrimination come in. We want to go deeply into it to see those first two statements for what they are. Once you see the first two steps for what they really are, all striving ends. It is not a linear journey anymore. You still cannot will against him. And that is why You have no control over the world you made. Text chapter 12, section 3. Take a close look at that statement for a moment. Observe what comes up around it. What are your feelings about that? What does it mean to you to have no control over the world you made? Friend, my first reaction is, Oh no, this is bad news if I have no control over the world I made. Then, as I look at that statement, there is more of a feeling of relief. If I do not have control over the world I made, then I do not have to keep trying to control it. (sighs) There is a relief in the thought that there is no point in trying to control what is not controllable. I can just take my hands off it because it is pointless to keep them in there when it is of no avail. (laughs) It is a waste of time, a game. Why would I want to put my mind and attention there? David, Can you see how all-encompassing that statement is? You have no control over the world you made. Earlier we had a discussion about someone whom you felt was talking too much. That is a circumstance that fits under the umbrella. You have no control. Can you see how that fits in here? as well as all conceivable problems relating to specifics or wishing things could be different than they are. Friend, yes, that is coming to mind. All those examples of wishing things were different than they are and the idea that if they were different, then things would be so much better. David, 
we spent a whole session one time talking about the restlessness you were feeling. We traced it very carefully back to the belief that you had a choice in the world in form. Can you see how that is encompassed here? The whole concept of having to choose between things, circumstances, events and objects, all of the strain and struggle and even the restlessness of wondering what to do next or feeling like you should be doing something different. Can you see how it all gets blanketed under you have no control over the world you made. Friend, yes, that seems clear. But I do have this thought that the control lies with my mind, that keeping my mind focused on my intention will give me control over the world. There is still a thought that the world might change or people might change as a reflection of the change in my mind. That would be the control I would have. The control would come through my mind and be reflected out into the world. David, people say things like, As I get clearer, the evolution of the world will improve and it will become a more peaceful place. That is a subtle example of still believing I have control over the world in some way. It is about getting to the point of the serenity prayer where you can see the things you can change. Friend, that would be my mind only. David, the Course says, For you do have control over your mind. Text chapter 12, section 3. That states it pretty clearly. While you have no control over the world you made, you do have control over your mind. That is where the control is. That sentence says nothing about the world. Nothing. Friend. But the world is in my mind. So how is it different? David. When we speak of having no control over the world you made, text chapter 12, section 3, we are speaking of the projected world or the script. You could even call it the wrong mind. Thoughts and the world that were projected from them. There is no control over that. But there is control over the purpose that I give the world. We are making a clear distinction between form and content. The idea that you do have control over your mind brings the two purposes in the mind into focus. The ego's purpose and the Holy Spirit's purpose. That is where you have the control because that is the decision. In fact, purpose is the only decision you have. It is still a metaphor, because in heaven there is no decision at all. Yet you cannot reach that state of being until you can see the choice where it is, until you see where you have the control. What I can change is my mind. I can decide between these two purposes. The line, accept the things I cannot change, 
refers to the script or the projected world. As the Course puts it, Seek not to change the world, but choose to change your mind about the world. Text Chapter 21 Introduction That fits right in with Seek not to change the world. Why? Because you have no control over the world that you made. It is pointless and fruitless to try to change something where no change is possible. Friend, so the idea that the world is a reflection of the mind does not in any way imply that there is control over the script. Only the way I look upon it will reflect the purpose I bring to it. If I bring the ego purpose to what I see, then that is what will be reflected back to me from the script. And from that same script, the Holy Spirit's purpose will be reflected back to me if that is what is in my mind. David Yes, in that sense the world is symbolic. It is representative of the purpose I am holding on to. The only thing that I have control over is the choice of the purpose that I give to the world. The real world is seeing and embracing the Holy Spirit's purpose as the only alternative. That is the world given a completely different meaning than the ego's purpose for the world, which is to just reinforce the separation and the guilt. But even the real world has no real purpose in the sense that once it is reached, it is seen as purposeless. If it had a real purpose, it would have a reality. But the real world is an illusion as well. We do not want to jump the gun too quickly here. We just want to follow this inward with the serenity prayer to see the only thing you can control. Friend, for me it is important to remember that the reflection that comes back to me does not have any objective existence. It all depends on how I am looking at it. There is not anything about it apart from how I am looking at it. I am thinking about what someone said to me recently. If I start looking at things differently, will things in form change? But it is not about anything changing in form. It is only about my perception or the interpretation I am assigning to that form. Friend, yes, it is not a change in form. It is really a change in how I am seeing the script. The script is written. A change in my mind does not change anything about the script. It only changes my perception of the script. David, we began with a simple thing. You have no control over the world you made. Now you are bringing in the element of the script is written. That would seem to go with you have no control over the world you made. If it is written, if it is past tense, it is over and done. How do you change a painting that is finished? How do you change something if it is already over and done? This brings in the sense of time. The metaphysical reason why you have no control over the world is because it is all past. Lesson 7 I see only the past. 
My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. Those past thoughts are showing me a past world. And therefore, if I think I can change the screen, so to speak, or change the script, then what do I believe? I believe I can change the past. Friend, or I believe it is not really past, that it is the present instead of the past. David, yes, when looking through the body's eyes, we are seeing through the deceived mind. The deceived mind sees only the past. As this is illuminated to us, we come to see that any attempt to change things in the world is an attempt to change the past. That is the whole basis for special relationships. The mind believes it has been deprived. It keeps seeking outside of itself because it keeps trying to tinker with the screen. Another body, another relationship, another car, another house, another climate, more money more idols in whatever form they are. But underneath it all is the thought. I have been deprived in the past and I believe that I can tinker with the screen or change the content of consciousness and rearrange it in some way that I can find a way to get what I was deprived of. But it will not work. It cannot work. Trying to make up for something in the very place where the deprivation was believed to happen. The only place of completion is in my mind. The Holy Spirit is the answer to what I seem to be feeling as a lack. Suddenly, all the sections on special relationships start to click in with these basic underlying metaphysics. Friend, is it to recognize that there is no deprivation in the world? The only void of vacancy or lack of fulfillment is in the mind that believes that there is a lack. David. And whether you call it scarcity principle or lack or deprivation, it is the ego's purpose. There are only two purposes in the mind. Therefore, the only way to see a solution to the problem is by changing the purpose in the mind. It has nothing to do with the world. Another quote that dovetails with this is Only a constant purpose can endow events with stable meaning. Text chapter 30, section 7 Of course, it is the ego's purpose that makes everything seem disunited and like separate events. The constant purpose is the thread that ties all the events together. The script is really a continuous thing, rather than discrete events. I did this next, and this happened, then I went there. That is the way it is talked about when the mind believes in sequential time and events. But once we get a sense that there is a purpose that ties all together, that is when the fusion between all events takes place. Friend, I am glad we are looking at purpose and couching it in the context of the script having been written. Because when I 
when we remember that the script is written, it takes everything out of the doing altogether. The script is written. There is nothing for me to do in relation to the script. David, yes, minds do not do. Minds do not act. Purpose is not in the realm of actions. Friend, so any time I think I am doing, I am not looking at it from my purpose? friend. There is that whole choice thing. Do I do this or do I do that? What is it I am supposed to do right now? Then I have totally forgotten that it is already done, that the script is already written. What is it that I am supposed to do? That is the wrong question. David. I would like to clarify this a bit more because we are talking about rungs again. In the workbook, he says to ask the Holy Spirit very specifically, What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? Workbook Lesson 71 Someone could read that and think, what if I am guided to do something, to call someone? That seems to be a doing. What if I am guided to move someplace or this or that? Friend, I think when the guidance is there and it is clear, the question does not come up. It is so obvious. David, yes. But we want to go deeper to the point that I am talking about. Accepting the atonement is accepting a purpose in the mind. And that is an abstract purpose. It is coming to the point of seeing the impossibility of doing. It is reminiscent of the I need do nothing section when he talks about sinking into your mind. The unholy instant is the time of bodies, but in no single instant does the body exist at all. Those are the kind of statements that point to what we are talking about. Minds do not do. There must be level confusion if I perceive myself doing anything. Sitting in a posture for eight hours. Going out and traveling the country. Speaking or anything we have talked about as the metaphors that are part of the Holy Spirit's plan. We want to move to the place of sinking into the mind beneath all the concepts, moving toward accepting the atonement. That is the purpose. From our discussion here, that should be coming clear. Salvation is a thought in the mind. It has nothing at all to do with the world. That is why we talk about moving into mysticism. It should be another step to begin to see that there is no other place to go but into mysticism. In the sense that the solution is in the mind. What unfolds our discussion is the experience of being drawn into the silence to hear that voice and to accept that purpose. Friend, this really resonates with me 
I'm trying to see how what you are talking about is consistent with some of the other things that we have talked about doing. Sometimes when we talk about those other things, there is something that does not feel quite right. Like, when we talk about the doings of going here and there and doing this and that, somehow I have to see that those things are still stepping stones. But I think at times, why are we putting so much energy and attention into things that are just stepping stones? Why do we not just go for the ultimate step, the final step, instead of taking these stepping stone steps? David, it is good that you bring that up because, as I said, the whole point is to come to that clarity. As we go into this ultimate stuff, it should feel inviting to go into the silence. Everything that we talk about, like doing gatherings and so on, it is all peripheral. That is all for a mind that has resistance to the ultimate. Maybe I could put it in the context of sinking down into the mind, completely letting go into the silence, opening the mind up to the revelatory experience is the ultimate. The question I hear coming in is, where does the perceptual stuff of going places and doing things fit with that. The best description is in the early part of the course where Jesus talks about miracles and revelation. He says that when the mind is too afraid of revelation, too afraid of the light, miracles are necessary to prepare the mind. Miracles reduce fear. They seem to collapse time. In a sense, this discussion is a miracle. Actions like those you do when you are in your purpose are like time collapsers. They are all preparations for the mind. Friend, Yes, I have experienced that. Because of the miracles, the trust has deepened. And the attraction of turning to the light or towards the uh, revelatory experience has increased as the trust deepens. It is all simultaneous. It happens together. This answers my question why it seems to be necessary to do all that stuff. It is really not necessary, but it is helpful in alleviating the fear. David Another way of couching the same thing we are talking about is the description of miracles as the means and revelation as the end. To reach the end, you have to want the means. Everything we do, when we talk about starting with specifics and working it back to what is my perception of this in my mind, is always working back to the miracle. You have to desire and want the means if you are going to reach the end. The end is terrifying to the deceived mind. It is not that the deceived mind has so much difficulty with the miracles, but it is terrified of the end. It does not want the means. It would rather focus on the specifics and the body and use that as its means for its atonement 
with a small a, which is really death. The ego has a purpose for the world, and the means of achieving it are to focus on the specifics and use them to get what it wants. Underneath all that is the intent to reinforce the separation, perpetuate the sleep, and protect itself. The turnaround is miracles are the means to reach revelation. They reduce the fear. They collapse time and eliminate guilt. Revelation is offered. It is a given from God. But there is the matter of being aware of it and opening to receive what has already been given. If the mind is too afraid, it is not going to open. It is not going to be open. The characteristics of teachers of God start off with trust. And the last characteristic of a teacher of God is open-mindedness. That makes sense because what is left when the advanced teacher of God has laid aside all fear and ego is the receptivity to receive what has always been there but has been denied. As long as there is even a subtle identification with the body, there is still personification. It is not even necessary for the mind to believe that it is a body. But as long as it believes it is in a body or working through a body, that is still a personification. There is still a subject-object split. There is still some personhood. With that, there is fear of revelation. Revelation seems to be a threat to that construction of the world. As long as there is a belief in personhood, there is ordering of thoughts. A person is seen as being different than a pencil, different than a tree or a car or a rug. There is still a sense that the mind is working in and through a body. The body then seems to be pretty significant, more significant than the pencil. There still seems to be an ordering of thoughts. The body does not seem to be just another image on the screen. It seems to be important. In the manual for teachers, in a section called How is Healing Accomplished? Jesus says, There is no form of sickness that would not be cured at once. What is the single requisite for this shift in perception? It is simply this, the recognition that sickness is of the mind and has nothing to do with the body. What does this recognition cost? It costs the whole world for you. See, for the world will never again appear to rule the mind. For with this recognition is responsibility placed where it belongs not with the world, but on him who looks on the world and sees it as it is not. He looks on what he chooses to see, no more and no less. 
the world does nothing to him. He only thought it did. Manual for Teachers, Section 5, 2. You have to see that the mind is the decision maker. It is a common perception in the world to believe in persons, to believe that I am a person and that there are separate persons with separate private minds and that each of these persons has their own decision-making mechanism. It cannot be so. That is the belief that different figures can make decisions in the dream. That is not the case at all. It is the mind. The right mind is one decision and the wrong mind is another decision. Heaven and hell are decisions. Seeing the two purposes in the mind as decisions versus persons making decisions lifts it back from the screen. To accept the atonement, you must see that the mind is the only creative level. It is the only place where decisions can be made. At the very end of this section it says that to accept this, the insignificance of the body must be an acceptable idea. This goes full circle with what we are talking about, seeing that the body is no different than a pencil. In the end, we see that there are not any separate objects. There is nothing in the world that exists in and of itself. It is all a tapestry. One illusion is all illusions. Illusions are one. The ego, the tree trunk and all the different branches are the same. Friend, to even speak of something as in and of itself is to imply that there is something apart from the mind. Otherwise, there would be no in and of itselfness. David, workbook lessons 183 and 184 really get to that. I call upon God's name and on my own. Workbook Lesson 183 The fourth paragraph reads Repeat the name of God and little names have lost their meaning. No temptation but becomes a nameless and unwanted thing before God's name. Repeat his name and see how easily you will forget the names of all the gods you valued. They have lost the name of God you gave them. They become anonymous and valueless to you. Although, before you let the name of God replace their little names, you stood before them worshipfully, naming them as gods. Repeat the name of God and call upon yourself, whose name is His. Repeat His name and all the tiny nameless things on earth slip into right perspective. Those who call upon the name of God cannot mistake the nameless for the name, nor sin for grace nor bodies for the Holy Son of God. Workbook Lesson 183 The lesson closes with this paragraph. All little things are silent. Little sounds are soundless now. The little things of earth have disappeared. The universe consists of nothing but the Son of God 
who calls upon his father. And his father's voice gives answer in his holy father's name. In this eternal still relationship, in which communication far transcends all words, and yet it is seen in depth and height, whatever words could possibly convey is peace eternal. In our father's name, we would experience this peace today. And in his name, it shall be given us. Workbook Lesson 183 It is this sense we are talking about, this silence. Anything that could seem to be done or anything within the perceptual realm is just to come to this point. It is not about traveling the country and saving the world or evangelizing the course. It is not about reaching people or corresponding with people or helping anyone else get clear. There is not anyone else. It is about having a burning desire to just have the name of God in my mind. Period. This sets the table for accepting the atonement. You cannot accept the atonement until you can discern the wisdom to know the difference. Until you can discern between the things you cannot change and the things you can change. That is the discernment between form and content. Friend, that is the end of level confusion, of thinking there is cause in the world. David, yes, in all the different ways that we are saying it, that is the end of level confusion. It is, it all says the same thing from different angles. It is so simple. It is good to get the metaphors clear. A common one that I have used in the counseling talks and presentations that I have done is the metaphor of the right mind and the wrong mind and the seeming vacillation between the two. It seems as if the mind can choose either or, as if there is a decision maker. Clarity is coming to see that the right mind is a decision and the wrong mind is a decision and they are mutually exclusive. Friend, if they are mutually exclusive, it cannot be sometimes kind of thing that allows for vacillation. If one is real, then the other is not. There is nothing else to go toward except what is real. David, step off the rung. It is the top of the ladder. Friend, we are back to the idea that truth is all there is. David, God's will is all there is. That is the advanced form of practice, so to speak. First you look at all the seeming obstructions and see that all the obstructions are one. Then you embrace all that there is. The truth is truth, and only the truth is true. There is nothing causative in the world. There is nothing that can be controlled or changed in the world. Absolutely nothing. You have to have examined and explored deeply to see that. That makes way for. The truth is true, 
and nothing else is true. Workbook Lesson 152 But you cannot just jump to that without doing a thorough examination, without first coming to the realization that there is nothing you would hold back from the light. No remnants of personhood. Friend, without that examination could the statement the truth is true and nothing else is true be anything but an idea? Could it ever be an experience except from the examination of all the beliefs that stand in the way? David, that is right. Hence, this is a course working from the bottom up, not from the top down. You must bring illusions to the truth. You cannot bring the truth to illusions. It can seem on the surface like there is a shortcut to bringing truth into illusions. But you can see that it does not work. It produces the illusion of enlightenment, not the experience. Ask yourself if there are any images in your mind that seem to be causative or images you think you can still control, that would be a denial of the truth is true. To start from the bottom up is to hold on to the intention to let go to the Holy Spirit and have Him orchestrate. Start off with where the mind assumes it is and what it assumes to be true and then peel the layers away or dissolve the question. That is truly bringing the illusions to truth. This brings the mind to a point of stillness where all the questions would be dissolved. An absoluteness where the questions have dissolved into the experience, into the silence.